Good evening. I'm Keith Cole, and I have the privilege to serve as the Executive Director for the Wolf River Conservancy. Welcome to tonight's very special lecture, The Cryptic Life of Owls. We thank you for being with us tonight. We know you're going to enjoy the program. This is part of our ongoing environmental education outreach. We want to first thank our presenting sponsors. They are Buckman, which is our corporate sponsor, and the Crawford Howard Family Foundation, which is our foundational sponsor. We also want to acknowledge our 2021 corporate benefactors, which includes AutoZone, Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundation, Griffles Foundation, International Paper, and Marine Container Technologies. Thank you to those corporate benefactors that help us in such a tremendous way throughout the year. But of course, all of our supporters, all of our donors, whether they're corporations, community organizations, individuals, they are all very important to us as we go about delivering our mission throughout the year. And of course, our mission has remained constant, which is to preserve and enhance the Wolf River and its watershed as a sustainable natural resource. So thank you for helping us do that. Also, a reminder you saw on the screen earlier, our Greenway Soiree, which is our largest single fundraiser, this year will be a completely virtual event online auction. You can go to our website, wolfriver.org, to learn more about how you can register and have fun and bid on some really great prizes and help the Conservancy at the same time. So please do that. Thank you so much for that. Some housekeeping details, we ask that you do not record tonight's program. However, if you registered, uh, next week, you should receive a link that will have a copy of the recorded program. So if you missed some of it tonight, you can see it again. So look for that uh, in a future email from the Conservancy. We're very excited about tonight's presenter. That would be Mitchell Pruitt. He is a PhD student working under Dr. J.D. Wilson in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Arkansas. He studies dispersal movement, which you and I know as migration, and owls of North America. Mitchell studies several species, including the northern saw-wet owl and the barred owl, but has broad interest in all sorts of birds of prey. Mitchell Pruitt will provide an overview of the members of the owl family with a focus on the northern saw-wet owl. During his master's work under the late Dr. Kimberly Smith, Mitchell studied northern saw-wet owls in the Arkansas Ozarks. We all know how beautiful the Ozarks are. Prior to the beginning of this research in 2014, the saw wet owl was virtually unknown to Arkansas except for 13 horizontal records, excuse me, historic records. After five years of migration study, the species is now understood to be a regular fall migrant throughout the Ozark Highlands echo region. And after two years of radio telemetry work, the species is considered as a winter resident in the upland pine forest in northwest Arkansas. Mitchell will present tonight what is currently known about the northern saw wet owls in the Ozark Highlands, as well as discuss opportunities for where research can go from here. When he's not in the field or in the lab, you might catch Mitchell with binoculars and a camera in hand traveling wherever the birds take him. Help me welcome tonight. Mitchell Pruitt. Welcome, Mitchell. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here, and hopefully everyone out there gets to learn a few things about owls tonight. Um, so like Keith said, well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Sorry, what am I doing? Presenting without a presentation. Okay, so like Keith said, my name is Mitchell Pruitt, and I am a PhD student at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, um, and tonight I'm going to talk about um, what an owl is, so I'll spend about half of the time in two different places. So I'll talk first about what an owl is, um, as well as some owls that can be found in Arkansas and Tennessee. Um, I think a lot of our audience is from this region tonight, so um, we'll go there to Arkansas and Tennessee. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about my research. 
So for starters, what is an owl? Owls are birds of prey, um, which means that they have hooked beaks and talons. So hooked beaks for um, capturing and subduing their prey. So we're tearing flesh with the hooked beaks. We're capturing prey with talons. Owls are in an order of taxonomy called Strigiformes. And this is, this is the order that all owls are classified under. And there are over 200 species of owls worldwide. These um, 220 species are classified into two families, Titanidae, which are barn owls, and Strigidae, which is everything else. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Most owls are nocturnal, which means that they're active at night, um, and crepuscular, which means that they are active um, during the dawn and dusk period. So nocturnal is at night, and crepuscular is during the dusky hours of the day. Um, and some species, although not many, are actually diurnal, which means that they're active during the day. Most owls are solitary. Um, so we are living alone mostly, unless it's the breeding season. And owls also have a variety of special adaptations that make them spe uh, special even within um, the group of birds of prey that they're in. So some of these include the ability to fly silently. Um, so if you look at these feathers here, let me see if I can get a laser pointer. So these are two owl feathers, and you can see here that these are very fuzzy. Um, so if you looked at a bird feather from, say, a chicken or a goose or something like that, they would not have this sort of fuzzy appearance. And some of their flight feathers, so feathers along the wing, also have this sort of comb-like structure um, to the edge of the feather. And this allows them, this allows them to um, have the air sort of broken up as it travels across the wing when they're flying. Um, and they can fly silently because of this. And you would want to fly silently um, because you are trying to sneak around at night and capture prey. Okay, another special adaptation um, that owls have is asymmetrical ears. So if you were to be able to look at an owl skull, you would see that one ear hole is slightly higher than the other ear hole. And this allows them to get a slightly different auditory stimulus. Um, so a different sound basically, depending upon what ear the sound is entering. Um, and they can use these slightly different um, auditory stimuli to better triangulate on prey items. So lots of cool things going on with owls. Another interesting adaptation is something called a facial disc. And most people recognize um, that owls sort of have this um, disc-shaped face, but maybe you didn't know it was actually called a facial disc. Um, and this sort of acts like uh, a satellite sort of, or a funnel that funnels sound towards the ears. So what looks like um, just a cute face basically actually has a lot of um, a lot of reasoning behind it. So funneling sound towards the ears. And another adaptation that owls have are um, a couple of different sight adaptations. So owls actually have stationary eyes. So humans and a lot of other animals um, have roughly spherical shaped eyes. So our eyes can move inside the sockets but owls have to turn their head in order to move their eyes because their eyes are fixed, they're cone-shaped. So owls have a binocular vision range of about 70 degrees, and a binocular vision range is the range where both of your eyes are working together to form a single picture. Um, and in humans, for example, just as a comparison, we have a binocular vision range of about 140 degrees. So almost twice that of owls. So owls are constantly moving their head um, to get different views. Okay, 
It's time for question one. I forgot to mention, we'll have some poll questions throughout here to see how much you know about owls. So here comes question one. the question feature working okay it's doing some strange stuff on my end oh okay cool we have some results all right so the question was owls can turn their heads all the way around true or false um, most of you said false which is the correct answer so there's a somewhat common belief that owls can turn their heads 360 degrees, which is false. Um, nothing can do that to my knowledge. Owls can turn their heads, whoops, around 270 degrees um, in one direction and the same distance back in the other direction. And this again has to do with their need to um, see without moving. So if you're sitting still and hunting, you're gonna want to say as, stay as still as possible um, so if just your head is moving, then that's to your advantage. All right, um, so moving on, um, owls occur on every continent except Antarctica. So owls are found across the world. So they're almost everywhere. I mentioned that there were two families, so Titanidae um, versus Strigidae. Titanidae, like I said, are the barn owls, um, B-A-R-N. And these people recognize often as having a heart-shaped facial disc. Barn owls um, are generally more nocturnal. So a lot of owls are crepuscular, which if you remember, um, they're active at dawn and dusk more so, uh, where there's a little bit more light. Barn owls, however, are more likely to be active in the deep dark of night. And for this reason, uh, they have slightly better hearing um, than their other relatives. And there are only a few species of barn owls in the world. There are like 20 or so, um, and then everything else around 200 is in the family Strigidae, which is every other owl, basically. So owls, um, this family is really diverse and has both the smallest and largest owls in the world are in this family. Um, and I think we have a second question. This is, this is a tough one. We'll see how many people out there know, um, know a little bit about owls. All right, the results are in. Okay, what is the largest owl in the world? Um, most people put great horned owl, which is a good guess. That's one of the largest owls we have in North America. Um, and the second most put Blackiston's fish owl, which is the correct answer. And I don't actually have that one in the presentation, um, but I'll, I'll show you the largest in North America here in a second. So good job for those of you who got that right. Um, so I mentioned that Strigidae, is the family of most owls. So we have the smallest owl in the world in this family, and that is the elf owl. So this cutie right here, you can see a researcher holding it to band. 
Um, this species is found in North America, so in the desert southwest, so like Arizona, New Mexico. And we have the largest owl in North America, which is the great gray owl. So this species here. Um, and this species occurs way up north. So like Canada um, and the Great Lakes region, you might find great gray owls. And great gray owls weigh um, around a thousand grams, which sounds like a lot. But for those of you who um, don't speak in the metric system, which is probably most everyone out there, a thousand grams is about the weight of um, a one liter water bottle empty. So not very much at all, like less than two to three pounds, which is incredible that a species that, or a bird this big can weigh so little. Okay, um, so I talked about how many owls were in world worldwide? So over 200 species. So let's narrow this down to Arkansas. Um, in North America, we have 19 species. And in Arkansas and Tennessee, we have seven species that occur regularly, meaning that they're pretty common. And then one to two um, species that are considered super rare visitors. Um, of the seven that occur regularly, Four can be found in our region year round, and three are considered non breeding residents, which means that they're only here in the winter. So let's take a look. Here are our four um, that are here year round. So we have a great horned owl that some of you clearly are familiar with. We have barred owl, eastern screech owl, and barn owl, B A R N. This is barred owl, B A R R E D. Um, and this is barn, like a barn, a building. Then we have three species that are in the region only during winter. So we have short-eared owl, long-eared owl, and the northern saw-wet owl. And then we have two species that are pretty rare, um, but they do happen into our region occasionally. And that is the snowy owl here and the burrowing owl here. And I'm actually not going to talk about these two. Um, if you're interested in uh, finding them in the region, uh, first off, good luck. But you can sort of search around online to see where they've been seen in the region before. Um, but I'm going to talk more about these seven. So let's start with our only member of Titanidae. So remember that family. This is our only member of Titanidae in North America. Um, the barn owl is a non-migratory resident, which means that it's here all year round. You can see the range map for the barn owl here. Um, and this species actually has one of the largest ranges of any owl in the world. So you can find barn owls here in Arkansas and Tennessee, and you can find them all the way down in southern Argentina, which is pretty crazy. Barn owls um, really love open country, so areas with sparse trees, particularly agricultural areas. Barn owls are widespread, so they have a large range, but they're rare. Um, and they're rare because barn owls are on the decline um, again. So with the arrival of Europeans in North America, um, the barn owl declined um, as we cleared land from native grasslands and open forests to agricultural areas. Um, they then got used to that and their numbers increased again um, and they adapted to the use of barns and grain silos for nesting. Um, but barn owls are declining again because once again agricultural practices are changing um, and the places that they became used to nesting in grain silos and barns um, look a lot different today. So they're not the classic wooden structures um, that have kinks and holes in them that these owls could get into. So these structures have changed today, our agricultural practices have changed, so the barn owls are once again um, declining. Here we have some barn owls. So here's, this is another picture. These are just pictures for fun. Um, and then here's one actually in a barn. Barn owls aren't the only owls that you might find roosting in a barn. So if you ever walk into an old barn, 
um, be aware that you might get scared by an owl flying out over your head. <laughs> So another owl that we have that is a resident in the region is the great horned owl. Great horned owls are also very widespread. Um, so we clearly have them here in our region, um, but they're also found in some places in South America. Great horned owls love um, woodland, particularly woods that are near open areas. Um, and they do use some fields and prairies. So some, they do use some open areas. Um, but they are more associated with woodland. Like I said, this species is widespread and it's very common. This is, if you see a big owl in, in just on your forays around the area, it's probably going to be one of two species and great horned owl is likely to be um, one of those. So here we see a great horned owl here. Um, and then here's another one in a huge nest, great horned owls. Most owls, I should say, are cavity nesters. Um, so they nest in cavities in trees, barns, whatever. Um, but great horned owls use other birds' nests. So they actually, these great horned owls that are on the nest did not build this nest. This nest was built by um, probably a red-tailed hawk, so a large bird. And great horned owls will come in and take over them before the hawks can get back to um, the breeding site in the spring. So they definitely usurp other species generosity and nest building. So here's another species that you are, this is, I mentioned that there were two species. If you're out and you see a big owl that, that you're likely to see, and this is the second one. So first was great horned owl and the second is barred owl. Um, this is our final resident species that I'm going to talk about. Um, and barred owls love deciduous woodland, particularly woods along streams and rivers. And they're widespread and common throughout North America. And as I'm going around town in Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is a pretty urban area, I often see and hear barred owls um, just in the city. So it doesn't take much of a forest patch to satisfy barred owls. Um, and with that, we have question three. Okay, cool. So the results are in. Um, the question was, barred owls are considered an invasive species in parts of its range. Um, and most people selected true, which is correct. So barred owls are considered an invasive species in a part of their range. Um, and that is right here on the map in the Western US. An invasive species, for those who don't know, is a species that is somewhere that it's not supposed to be and it is thriving. Um, and that is the case for barred owls here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, barred owls naturally only occurred in Eastern North America, so here. And at some point, they hopped over the prairies of the Great Plains and ended up in the Pacific Northwest which has become a serious problem for a species called the spotted owl, which is very similar to the barred owl. Um, they inhabit similar habitats, what have you, and barred owls are out competing them and taking over the habitats that spotted owls are using. Um, and that's a problem. Spotted owls are an endangered species um, and it's been an ordeal. I know some people who work at the interface between barred and spotted owls in the Pacific Northwest. And um, it's sort of an uphill battle at this point, unfortunately. But barred owls are still cool. So here we have some pictures of barred owls. Um, this picture was actually, I took this picture in Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, in the middle of downtown, one of the busy old neighborhoods downtown that has lots of nice trees. Um, and this pair of barred owls was nesting in a friend's backyard. 
Okay, so I lied. We have one more resident species. This is the Eastern Screech Owl, and this species is significantly smaller than the um, other three that I've shown you so far. I don't know if anybody has picked up on this little graphic. I should have mentioned it, but have a little graphic of the owl size compared to human. So take it for what you will. Um, Eastern Screech Owls are another resident. So you can see them here um, throughout Eastern North America. Um, they, this, this part of their range, well, this isn't their range, but where their range stops, another species picks up the torch. And this is the Western Screech Owl. Um, bird people are very creative with their naming, obviously, Eastern and Western. Um, Eastern Screech Owls love deciduous woodland. So deciduous woodland um, being the types of trees that lose their leaves in fall. So those are deciduous trees. Um, and again, the species is widespread and common, um, not necessarily as common in urban areas. You have to sort of get out of cities and that sort of, that sort of thing um, to see them. You still might see them in a city, but not as much as barred or great horned owls. Here we have some eastern screech owls. Um, they come in, in our region. You can find eastern screech owls in two different color phases, they're called. Um, and so it's like being born with blonde hair, being born with red hair or whatever. Um, some of them are hatched with this really pretty rusty rufous coloration. And then some of them end up um, this nice sort of gray and black barring here, um, which is pretty interesting and unique to screech owls. Okay, so now moving on to our migratory species. Um, here we have the short-eared owl. Um, this species is a winter resident in our region. You can see right here. Um, and they prefer prairies and open agricultural areas. So you won't really find this species in the woods. Um, and short-eared owls are common in the right habitat. So if you have a good prairie, prairie pra ugh, that's hard to say, prairie patch locally, um, then you might find short-eared owls. So here's a short-eared owl perched. The best way to see them is this right here. So um, this bird has come out at dusk over its prairie habitat to hunt. Um, this species in the winter, when it's in our region, is colonial. Um, so they, they are often together in groups. Um, they'll roost together down in the grass during the day. Um, and right around sunset, they'll pop up and they'll all fly around and start hunting. Um, and it's actually really cool to see. Um, sometimes you can, you can be standing in a field with like 20 or 30 of these owls flying over you, which is just incredible. And this is one here. Um, their silhouette looks a lot like a bat or a moth kind of when they're flying. They're really floppy, not, not very um, graceful flyers at all. So another migrant that we have in the region is a long-eared owl. Um, for those of you out there who might be bird watchers or um, know a little bit about owls or birds in general, you know that this species, just because it's a winter resident in our region, does not mean that they're easy to find. Um, they're considered a winter resident in, in our region, but there are very few of them, and the ones that are here are pretty secretive. Um, like their cousin, the short-eared owl, they are associated with open areas, but rather than spending most of their time in the grassland or in the open area, um, they prefer woodland nearby, specifically conifer trees like cedars and pines. So anything that in winter has a lot of cover. And you can see that here. So here is um, a long-eared owl roosting during the day in a cedar tree. Um, and here's a picture too. I have some colleagues up north who um, study long-eared owls during migration um, and they're, they're pretty easy to capture apparently. So they tell me. Um, I've never been up there to see them, but I would, I would love to do so. And this was at uh, Bird Observatory in Michigan. Okay, so um, the last migratory species that I'm going to talk about is the one that 
I'll just talk about for the rest of the presentation. This is the Northern Saw Wet Owl. Um, the Saw Wet Owl is migratory through the region and probably a winter resident. Although you see here, our region is not on the map. So Arkansas and Tennessee is not included in their range. Um, and I know this map is very convoluted with lots of colors, but just focus on um, the eastern portion of North America here. So this and focus on the blue specifically, which is the winter range. And you can see that the extent to this winter range, according to this range map, ends in like Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and doesn't reach Arkansas and Tennessee, which is probably not accurate. Um, so saw wets prefer mixed woodland during the breeding season. So you'll often find them roosting, I mean, um, yeah, roosting or nesting in deciduous trees. So those trees that lose their leaves in fall, um, but during the breeding season in the summer, they have those leaves on them. Um, and so you'll find them there in the summer, which for them is up here in Canada region is their summer range. And in winter, we find them most often associated with conifer trees. So again, pine trees, cedar trees, things that have cones and keep their leaves all year round. Um, saw wets, like I mentioned, are rare, um, but probably more common than we think. And the extent to their winter range currently is unknown. Um, an interesting thing about saw wets is that pretty much wherever they've been sought in winter in the US, they've been found. Um, so the sky is the limit at this point, I guess. Um, and with that, I will show you some pictures of saw wets really quick and move into what I do with them. So here we have some saw wet pictures that you can look at while you do question four. And this is, you can see they're very tiny. So here's one on um, my hand. So this is, I study these, like I said, um, and this species is the third smallest owl um, in North America. So this question is a, is a trick question. There's only one right answer, obviously. Twenty-three percent answered no that the sawet is not the cutest owl in the world. Wow, we'll have to talk after. Okay, so let's talk about what I do. Um, so the Arkansas Sawet Owl Project is sort of a lump name um, that myself and several other people started um, in 2014. Um, prior to beginning our research. Sawets were considered really uncommon in winter um, and even vagrant to the region, which vagrant means that it just happened to show up and it's not supposed to be here. We enjoy it while it's here and it moves on. Um, so vagrant, something that's not supposed to be um, within the range that, that we were in. Um, and so uncommon in winter um, to really rare in the Ozark Highlands, which is the region that I'm focusing on. And you can see on the map here, um, this blue outline is roughly the Ozark Highlands ecoregion um, is what it's called. So Ozark Highlands in this region, that's what we're focused on. Um, and prior to this research also, there were fewer than 30 records for the whole region. So, so less than 30 sawwets had ever been documented in this region. In 2014 and 2015, um, I and my late master's advisor, Dr. Kimberly Smith, um, launched an exploratory study in Northwest Arkansas. And much to our surprise, we were successful. Um, and, and we were very successful. We didn't just catch one owl, which um, we expected to catch zero, um, but we caught, we caught a lot and continue to do so to this day. So from 2014 to 2019, um, our goals were to document migration of sawwet owls through the Ozark Highlands. You'll see this four letter abbreviation a lot and it stands for Northern Sawwet Owl. So if you're confused about what that abbreviation means, it's just the owl that I'm talking about. So our, our goals were to document the migration of sawwets through the Ozark Highlands. 
um, determine their status during winter in northwestern Arkansas. And given that they were here during winter, um, our goals were to locate their roost sites during the day, document how long they were staying during the season, um, and look at their habitat preferences while they were here. So um, how do we do this? From 2014 to present, we have done migration monitoring. Um, and this takes place from October to December. Um, so that's the migration season that out these the sawwet owls are moving through Arkansas. We capture them with something called a mist net, which you can see right here. Um, and it's so-called mist net because it is nearly invisible um, like mist. Not that mist is invisible per se, um, but you get the picture. So it's a net that the birds can't see, hopefully. And we lure them into the nets on their migration using um, something called an audio lure, which is just a fancy sciencey way of saying we play their recording constantly all night long. Um, once we catch an owl in these nets, it is taken out and it goes inside for processing. Um, processing is a lump term that includes banding the bird and collecting various pieces of data from them. Um, so we, each one gets uh, a little aluminum band that has a unique number on it. Um, and this number, if it's ever captured again, allows the person who captured it um, to then say that, oh, uh, this bird was originally banded in Arkansas, um, and now maybe it ended up back on the breeding grounds in Canada somewhere, which is, which is cool. So 2016 to 2018, during my master's, um, we were using radio transmitters to, um, to tr track sawwets that were wintering in Northwest Arkansas. And here you can see these radio transmitters. They're very small um, and have a long antenna. And once they're on the bird, it sort of hangs off like this um, and they're harmless and they get used to it. Um, and we used elastic sewing thread as a leg loop harness. So this went around their legs um, and they wore it like a little backpack. And um, these were temporary. So the reason we used the elastic sewing thread is because at some point, probably along their spring migration route back to the north, um, this thread would rot and the transmitter would fall off. So they don't have a dead transmitter for their whole life. So from this study, we were, to able, we were able to establish that sawwets were migratory in the Ozark Highlands, which was much further south than historically believed to occur, um, across four sites. So um, two, we worked with two sites in Missouri, one site in Oklahoma, and then we had our field site here in Arkansas. And across those four sites, we captured over 400 sawwets during the study period. Um, 99 of those captures have come from Arkansas. And we now know that their peak in migration, so when you might expect to see the most in the area during migration, occurs during the first two weeks of November. And we also determined from the radio telemetry um, that some sawwets winter here in northwest Arkansas, which again is significantly further south than they were historically believed to occur, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, and, and these birds were staying anywhere from one to 112 days in the area. Um, the, the birds on the lower end being birds that probably just passed through and continued their migration, um, and the birds staying longer um, were individuals that were actually spending winter in the area. And like I've mentioned before, um, these, these birds were primarily using open pine habitat, like what you see here in this picture. So um, historically open forest that um, as some of the old reports from Arkansas in the 1800s would say, um, you could take a team of horses with a wagon through the forest without having to um, cut much of a road or a trail. So this is historically what a lot of our pine forests would have looked like. So today things are a little bit different. I still do the migration monitoring in fall and will actually start in about a week. Um, but in order to keep things relevant and interesting moving forward, um, I, I have undertaken some new projects um, as, as a PhD student now. Um, and one of these that I'll talk about 
um, briefly is looking at the status of saw wets in the southern Ozark Highlands as a whole during winter. So once we identified that saw wets were using one pat, basically one site of pine forest in the Ozarks, what was next? Well, next is to expand as best as best we can, um, given the low number of people we have involved in the project. Um, and to do that, we um, started looking at other pine sites in the Ozark Highlands in order to determine um, the probability that sawwets were occupying specific pine forest patches. And I'll talk more about that here in a second. So this took place last winter. So this stuff is hot off the press and it's taken me since last winter to go through the data. Um, you'll see why. Uh, so last winter we collected this data, we deployed these things called autonomous recording units or ARUs, and that is this. So these, it, you can see it here in the picture. If you're familiar with game cameras, it's kind of like a game camera, except it doesn't take photos or video, it takes sound. So these are, they're recording devices. And we put these out at 56 different sites last winter, all in um, this open pine forest habitat. These were set to record um, sound at 15 minute intervals every hour from sunrise to or from sunset to sunrise, which we ended up with about three and a half hours of data per night. So multiply that by 56 plus however many nights we had the units out. And you can see why it has taken me um, more than six months to go through this data. So here you can see these sites spread across the Ozarks. This is Northwest Arkansas here, if you're familiar with the area, cities like Fayetteville, Springdale, Rogers, and Bentonville. So we had sites spread out across the area from east to west and north to south down here. Um, this is very rural area um, deep in the Ozark National Forest. And for perspective, here you can see those sites on a larger scale. So here here we are in Memphis, some of you guys tonight here in Memphis, here's Arkansas, and then here were these sites in Northwest Arkansas here. So these units collected over 900 hours of data. Um, and from that, we caught saw wets on the recordings at 27 new sites. So that was 27 out of 56 sites, which means that 48% of these sites were occupied, directly occupied by saw wet owls, which is just very exciting. Um, I can't wait to write this up and publish it somewhere, um, hopefully in the near future. Um, but the beauty of statistics, and I will not, I won't bore you with the lesson, but the beauty of statistics is that um, based on the, they're called occupancy models, based on these occupancy models I was using, um, and the, the features of these 48% of sites, the statistical models predicted that even though I only actually caught saw wets on recordings at 48% of the sites, based on the features of these sites, the saw wets could occur at up to 83% of these pine sites, which is very exciting. So there's potential for saw wets to really be using the region um, in a significant way for wintering, which was previously not known. Um, so sawwets have a lot of different vocalizations. Let me see if I can turn the laser pointer off. Um, oh, that didn't work. Uh, okay, so whoops. Sawwets have a lot of different vocalizations and I hopefully will play them for you here. Okay, scratch that. Um, so that is to say they have a breeding vocalization that is called a solicitation call. And this is a very obvious vocalization. You can't miss it. It's really loud. Um, but they don't, they don't make that vocalization pretty much at all during the winter. Um, so they resort to these quieter calls that are more obscure. Um, and this is what I was able to pick up on the recording. So never the breeding vocalization and always these more obscure calls, which sort of may speak to why 
um, we've missed them in the region in the past because people aren't as familiar with some of these other sounds that they make. So from, from all of the work of the Arkansas Sawwet Owl Project so far, we've established that Sawwets are migratory in the Ozark Highlands, which was further south than historically believed. Um, we know that some winter in the region, again, further south than believed. Um, we've determined that they may use the pine forest in the region very extensively. Um, however, we reach our limitations in that further study across the southern U.S. as a whole um, is going to be required to determine their winter status throughout the region. But the fact that pine forest um, seems to be important for saw wets while they're here is exciting because pine forest is a uh, one of the major habitat components um, throughout the southeastern U.S. Um, so, so all along we've probably been overlooking a significant portion to this species winter range. Um, and with that I'll leave you this figure that sort of is just food for thought. So here in gray you can see the winter range um, as we think we know it of saw wet owls. So once again as I mentioned earlier you can see that this stops in northern Missouri um, and southern Illinois, Indiana, barely reaching down into Kentucky here. And that's, that's what we know about the extent of the Sawwets range right now. Um, but black on the map here shows the extent of three of the most major pine species and where they occur. So all the black on the map is the extent of southeastern pine forest. And if we know that they're here in northern Arkansas, um, we know I have colleagues who work in northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, northern Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. We know they're there. So like I said, the sky is the limit here. Um, who knows? They could, occur, they could occur in winter as far south as Florida, which is maybe unlikely, but, uh, but an exciting thought. We just don't know. So um, a grand question, why does this all matter? I have people ask me why owls all the time. So um, hopefully this gives you some insight. Um, most owls are very understudied and their life histories are a mystery. Um, we know very little about their um, ecology, specifically their distribution and their behaviors. And if we know so little about their ecology, how would we know if a species of owl um, should be considered uh, for conservation concern. Um, and this is a scary reality um, for a group of birds that are important predators in their respective ecosystems. Um, and the average, the, the absence of top predators can completely overthrow the balance of uh, certain ecosystems. Um, sort of spiraling off that, birds of prey can also be indicators of healthy ecosystems. So if the predators are happy, um, everything else in a way could be functional, functioning um, properly. And the very baseline that, that wins people over is that saw wet owls and other owls and birds of prey in general, everybody loves them, hopefully, um, and they're, they're good ambassadors. Charismatic species make good ambassadors for conservation messages. So what's next? Um, this year, I will continue migration monitoring here in Northwest Arkansas in the fall. Um, and I also plan to expand the use of those recording units um, outside of the Ozark Highlands. So I plan to take these units to Pine Forest in um, Eastern Arkansas, Central Arkansas, and Southern Arkansas um, with a focus particularly on um, the Wachita Mountains where there is significant upland pine forest just like here in the Ozarks. Um, during migration monitoring, I'm working with some people to take blood samples um, and we'll study how parasites might be affecting saw wet owls. Um, and lastly, I'll leave this. I'll just drop this bomb and, and walk away. And if, if anybody has questions, then <laughs> they can ask me about it. Um, but a bulk of my PhD research is actually using feather samples to look at how sawwets are migrating continent-wide, so across North America. Um, and we can do this by something called stable isotope analysis, which is a bunch of chemistry um, 
that I sort of only have a baseline knowledge of. This is where colleagues who are helpful come into play. Um, and, and I'm learning a lot through sitting in the lab doing this stuff for my PhD. Um, but hopefully more interesting things to come from that. Um, finally, I have to make the shameless plug. Um, ecological research is expensive, um, but often underfunded, um, particularly ornithological research. Uh, if you feel inspired and feel inclined to donate, um, you can do so. I've included a QR code here that will take you directly to um, my website uh, with uh, specifically a support my research page. Um, or if you're not into QR codes, you can go to the URL here, uh, mitchellpruitt.com slash research. Um, and common costs, just so you know where your money is going, um, it goes into sample analysis. So analysis of the blood samples, analysis of the feather samples, um, travel to and from field sites, batteries for the um, audio lure that we use to catch the saw wets, as well as the recording units. They're very um, battery hungry. Uh, and then net replacements and, and some other field costs, depending. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you again to the Wolf River Conservancy for having me tonight. It's been a pleasure. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and stuck with me. Um, and I would be happy to take some questions if we have time. Oh, cool. Here's questions. All right. I've never done the Q&A feature in uh, Zoom before. I don't know why. Let me end the show and see. There we go. Okay, cool. All right. So Marie Branch says, how and why did the barn owls end up in a different family than the rest of the owls? What characteristics made that distinction? Um, sorry if I missed it in the presentation. Uh, you didn't miss it. I didn't talk about it. Um, there are some different morphological features, so physical features that um, ended up in Titanidae being classified differently um, from Strigidae. Um, there are some differences in the structure of their talons um, and then differences in their skull structure. Um, and something else major that I can't think of right now, but hopefully, hopefully that answered your question. Um, Stacy says, owl sounds unique. Do they communicate with each other? Um, so yes, owls communicate with each other um, within species. So there is some in-depth, um, we could do a deep dive into bird behavior um, where we talk about how other species know what um, other species are doing. Um, and so, but we won't, <laughs> I'll just leave it in, in like same species contact. So yeah, within the context of, of the same species, owls do communicate with each other. Um, a lot of owls pair for life more or less, um, unless a partner dies. So great horned owls and barred owls that we have locally are examples of this. Um, and they'll often communicate with each other. And specifically great horned owls, um, if, you, if you get a couple calling um, early in the breeding season, like February, March, you can actually hear um, a difference in the calls. So the females have a deeper pitch and the males have a higher pitch and you can listen to them call back and forth to each other. Um, somebody also said the burrowing owl is awfully cute, at least to me. Yes, burrowing owls are cute. Um, I agree that other owls are allowed to be cute um, and burrowing owls are one of them. Um, are cats and dogs any risk with owls as prey? Um, probably not cats. If you have a tiny dog like a, um, a chihuahua that's really small or something and you know you have great horned owls in your neighborhood, maybe don't, don't let the chihuahua just roam around by itself unattended at night. Um, but for the most part, not really much of a threat, um, maybe to feral cats more so kittens, 
um, but not a not a big threat. Are owls spooked by humans? Um, yes and no. So it depends on um, specifically urban species like barred and great horned owls. If you have an owl that is used to seeing you or used to traffic or other humans in the city, they're going to be less likely to be spooked. Um, but if you encounter an owl in a more rural setting where they're not as, as in tune to human activity, um, then you might, you might scare them more easily. But actually, um, if you find an owl on a roost during the day, it, first off, it's best not to bother it because if, if other birds cue in on, on its presence, then they could mob it until it moves out of the area and it's just using energy when it should be sleeping. Um, but that said, if you, if you find an owl on a roost, typically um, they're pretty good at pretending like you don't exist. Um, so do you think warming temps could increase their winter range in the southern areas? So saw wet specifically, um, maybe climate change could have something to do with um, saw wet range expansion, um, but currently there is no evidence of range expansion. Um, currently, we don't know enough to even know whether their range would be expanding, but based on what we know, they've probably been here all along. Um, but like I said, it's, it's one of those things that we don't know, which could be scary in the future. So yeah, no evidence really right now that climate change has affected their range. Um, so your finding of sawwets further south than previously known raises the question, why do you refer to migration? Um, where were they thought to be migrating to or from? Um, so sawwets are wintering further south than historically believed. So their breeding range is pretty well known um, in large part because they're easy to find during the breeding season because they're, they're vocalizing with a well-known vocalization more actively. Um, and so, so really it's this winter range that was unknown, um, but they're still migrating to get between the two. Um, and that's why it's sort of a gray area, like the owls that we capture um, in the fall are definitely migrants, um, but how many stay versus how many keep going wherever they're going on their migration route is sort of a gray area. We don't really know. And, and I don't think anybody does at this point, really. Um, where is the best place in Memphis area to see owls? Ooh, good question. I am not as familiar with birding in Memphis. Um, I, I grew up in Jonesboro, just across the river, um, but I've still never really birded in Memphis. I, I do know just across the river, um, there's a place called Wapanaka National Wildlife Refuge, and they have a pretty large population of barred owls. Um, and if you're there early enough in the morning, you're likely to see one. Um, in Memphis more specifically, um, the only place that I know of where you would be likely to see owls is probably Shelby Farms. Um, but really any older neighborhood that has a lot of trees probably has at least barred owls in it. Um, the um, question, then, oh, go ahead. Please forgive me, my you end your program. I just wanted to say the Memphis chapter um, uh -huh. would enlighten anyone on their owls are common and I would also along the and Kathy I just realized you you've been having some technical difficulties. I'm sorry I stepped away. You may want to put those locations in chat for everybody because your the audio broke up as well. I think that was the problem. Between, I think she's trying to tell everybody where they might could go in Memphis. Oh, okay. Uh, but she got kicked off, and I, I we got oh. her late to get back on. But you know how technical difficulties go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I should I just go on with questions then? Yeah, I think she'll chime back in. She's okay. on right now, but she just must have some video and audio problems. Now, okay. I'm here, but please continue. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so somebody asked, with 50-plus sites that I needed to check, um, when did I go check them? Um, so that's a good question. 
I had, I didn't mention this, but those acoustic recording units, I could just leave out. I hung them on a tree and left them for a few weeks at a time um, and would move them around among the sites. So I had around 20 of these units and I got 50 plus sites because I just moved them around at different times. Um, that said, it was still quite an undertaking and was lots of long hours last winter bumping down gravel roads in the middle of nowhere. Um, what species of pine in Arkansas seem to be the most prevalent on sites where you document sawwed owls? Shortleaf pine. Um, really only because shortleaf pine is the only prolific option in the Ozarks. Um, down in the Wachita's, I might expect them to use more loblolly pine if they're there. But again, just because loblolly pine is the dominant species there. Um, so yeah, I think it just has to do with the dominant pine in your region. Um, and from what we know up north where they're more common, um, they'll even use patches of invasive pine trees. Um, what do sawwets eat in the winter? So sawwets eat small mammals like uh, mice, shrews, voles, that sort of thing. Uh, had two of those. So what do sawwets eat in winter? Yep, small mammals. Mm -hmm. In the summer, uh, you might expect them to take more birds, large insects like uh, cicadas and big moths and that sort of thing, but still mostly small mammals. Um, how do you analyze the audio recordings to ID sawwet vocalizations uh, using manual methods, artificial intelligence methods, um, I wish the AI methods worked for me. So there are a lot of things that go into setting up um, machine learning type stuff to analyze sound files. Um, and the programs that I had available to me um, were not specific enough, so not fine-tuned enough to pick up some of these uh, softer, faraway sounds. Um, so I had to go through them manually. Um, but that said, I didn't listen to all the recordings. So I, I use a program that shows me a spectrogram, which is like a picture of the sound, basically. Um, and I could scroll through um, the spectrogram, look for the, the signature of a saw wet sound on the spectrogram and only listen as necessary. So um, it still took me a while, but a 15 minute sound file only took me like five minutes to get through, depending on how many times I had to stop and actually listen. Um, and then the last question, to what do you attribute the extension of the barred owls range into urban areas in the last few decades? Um, I am not really sure. Um, potentially that maybe more rural habitats aren't as suitable as they were or um, yeah, I don't really know because they're using, um, well, I don't want to speak for everywhere. In Northwest Arkansas, they use um, some of these forested older neighborhoods um, that have had trees for years potentially. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I don't know what would attribute the movement from rural to urban per se. Um, that was it. I think those were all the questions. Those were good questions. All right, Mitchell, I'm going to, um, do the closure for Kathy since she's having difficulties. Okay. And, um, first of all, thank you so much for being with us tonight and being the speaker. I know we learned a lot about, about owls. I certainly did. Um, uh, Kathy did put in the chat box that I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the Wolf River here in Memphis, uh, but all along the Wolf River is a great place probably to hear and maybe even see some owls. I know we've seen them before. They may have even caught one on, on one of our cameras before. But uh, cool. anyway, again, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you who are attending. Here we go. And we hope you have a good evening. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulty on my side too. <laughs> I apologize. But thank you, everyone. See you. Um, see you on the Wolf River soon. Mitchell, thanks again. Yep. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Mitchell.